Here we go. Hi, Anthony. Thank you for letting us know you can hear. Oh. <laughs> Bryce is here too. Oh, great, Bryce. Would have been nice to be sitting in front of everybody, making eye contact in physical reality, in physical reality. But this is what we're left with, so we'll. we'll I work know. I'm, I'm looking forward for you know live events again. Yeah. But this has this has you know other advantages. There are people from all over uh, who are coming it's, tonight. It's to easier event, in, so, in some ways, know, but uh, uh, I will be happy to reconnect physically. Leslie, you can read the, the messages, right? And, and Ralph, because our messaging coming in. Someone yeah. is, someone is uh, from England. From UK. That, you mean really? UK. Yeah. Yes. France, Frank, Frank Elaine. Yeah, uh, so that's the thing, Ralph. If we were in the bookstore, we wouldn't have people from the UK joining us. That's for sure. Yeah. Listen, I see Tony Gaida has asked the question, can he get recording permission? Uh, he wants to do uh, something with me later. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, there's someone from Australia. Huh. Um, how do I give recording permission? I'm not sure. Uh, Is this the Shakespeare and Kozum? Yes. Um, yes. So, Ronnie Diamond, this is the Shakespeare and Kozum. We will be recording it. We will be posting the link uh, later on our yes. Facebook, uh, social media, Leslie and I, so there right. will be a chance for people who don't get to sign in to uh, listen to it afterwards. Right, and if, if you email me, I will, uh, I will uh, send you the, the link to the recording. Uh, my email is francois at shakenco.com. Paul and Rob checking in, friends of mine. Welcome, oh, guys. <laughs> someone, Julien Chamois from France. Hello, Julien. It's nice to have you here. Well, you're right, Leslie. It does make for an international audience. And as we know, the UFO phenomenon is international. So uh, it gives a nice uh, worldwide cast. That's the advantage of being on Zoom. Right. It is. It yeah. is. And well, I. And and, and, and kudos to those who are joining us from France or the UK because of the time difference, it's really late for them. Hey, we Hi. just got Canada. How many countries have we got here? It's great. <laughs> Daniel, thanks for joining us from Canada. And you know, a lot of these countries are more attuned to UFO phenomena than we are in the States. Uh, as a matter of fact, the governments, I think, have been more forthcoming uh, in other places. So uh, Spain. Aaron from Spain, how awesome is that? <laughs> this is fun. We could just do this all night. Aaron is organizing an event with us next uh, April April second with uh, the uh, novelist Jim Jim Lewis. So if if you oh. like literature, also please join us on on June second for the the new book by Jim Lewis. This is April second. And a long time coming, and, and I'm really looking for that event too. Great. Yeah, we got somebody from Texas. England, born in Colombia. Wow. Yeah. You know, John, John Mack would have been in heaven. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I see. Uh, Los Angeles. We're going to wait a little longer because I think people keep Maryland. Well, they're traveling from Maryland and traveling from Texas. They travel from, so it takes a while to get here, you know. 
right across the river, Jersey City. Very famous sighting in, uh, in Jersey. It's in my book. Bud Hopkins mm -hmm. investigated it. That's what got him started. Yeah. Was that, it wasn't Jersey City. I don't know what, what it, was, it, was, it was opposite the cloisters. So about, yeah, uh, I don't know what, if it had a town name or if it was just. That park, um, yeah. Hudson, Hudson Park. Maybe that's what it's called. Park. Yeah. Famous UFO landing in 1977 or thereabouts. I don't remember yeah. the year. Some people see them, some people don't. That's part of the mystery. Some, there are people who don't see you? Right. You know, no, so he's talking about UFOs. Oh, UFOs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the chat box and wondering if maybe no. there was a technical issue. No. <clears throat> uh, okay, I think we're going to, to start. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this event hosted by Shakespeare and Company. Uh, Shakespeare and Company has three bookstores, two in Manhattan and one in Philadelphia. As you know, independent bookstores like us have been struggling through the pandemic and the support of individual customers like you is crucial, crucial to our survival. If you purchase the Believer from us instead of a major online company I will not even name, <laughs> Not only will you not pay more, but you will receive an autographed copy. Ralph was nice enough to stop by the bookstore and he signed a great number of copies. So please order The Believer tonight. If you have it already, order it for a friend. Purchase Leslie Kane's Surviving Death or consider, consider us for all your online orders or in-store if you live in Manhattan or Philadelphia. Our very survival depends on people like you. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome Ralph Blumenthal and uh, Leslie Kane. Ralph was an award-winning reporter for the New York Times. He co-authored the Times article in 2017, they broke the news of a secret Pentagon unit investigating UFOs. And he's the author of four nonfiction books, including Miracle at Sing Sing, How One Man Transformed the Lives of America's Most Dangerous Prisoners. And he is also a distinguished lecturer at Baruch College. Uh, Leslie Kane is the New York Times bestselling author of UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. She's an independent investigative journalist and she has co-authored the 2017 New York Times Pentagon story and a series of other Times stories on UFOs with Ralph Blumenthal. She's the author of the 2017 book, Surviving Death, a journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife, which is the basis for a 2021 Netflix documentary series with the same name. And who was John Mack? Well, according to author Jeffrey Cripple, John Mack was one of the few prominent American intellectuals who saw and said what was and still is really at stake in the UFO phenomenon, reality itself. And Ralph Blumenthal is the perfect biographer to take, to take up Mack and bring him to life in all his humanity and complexity on the page. You are in for a treat. A few housekeeping words. This is a Zoom webinar. Everyone is muted with video off except the authors and myself to avoid background noises and interruptions. You can type your comments and questions in the chat box or the Q&A section. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the evening. There won't be live questions. Uh, I have uh, put the links to, uh, to purchase the Believer and uh, Leslie Kane's book, Surviving Death, as well as our uh, website, the Shakespeare Company website. So before we start, please take a few seconds to order the books. Uh, as I said, you know, very uh, survival depends on people like you. Um, Ralph and Leslie, it's, it's your turn, it's your show. Thank you, Francoise. Leslie, over to you. Thanks for having us, Francoise. And yeah, I want to I want to second uh, her Francoise's 
plea for people to support independent bookstores. They're a dying breed and they really deserve support. Uh, this is the book. It's fantastic. And I agree with Francoise, there was nobody better than Ralph to write this book. And I think that's partly because Ralph is such a meticulous researcher, but he's also open-minded and interested in anomalous topics. And um, that's a great combination. So Ralph, as Francoise mentioned, I mean, you had this long history at the New York Times, you've written books about the mafia and Nazi war criminals and all kinds of really serious topics. And here you are coming out with this book about a man who studied alien abductions. So I'm sure people would like to know how you got from there to here. Well, thank you. It was, uh, it is a bit counterintuitive. And uh, I must say, I have never been abducted. I've often asked, have I seen a UFO? No. So like John Mack, who also had no personal experiences in this uh, field, um, I guess that makes me a little purer uh, to look into it. And John Mack was quite disappointed in, in fact in his life that he never did uh, see any of these uh, paranormal phenomena that he investigated. Um, and for the record, neither have I. Um, I got into it in, uh, like this. I was a correspondent in Texas for the New York Times and I picked up a used book one day called Passport to the Cosmos by John E. Mack, MD, a psychiatrist at Harvard. Uh, I read it, I was amazed um, that a Harvard psychiatrist was interested in the whole field of alien abduction and UFOs. Uh, it didn't seem natural. And I thought, gee, uh, maybe I'll give him a call. It could be an, a nice interview for the New York Times. Um, I had no idea how famous he already was. I was quite naive. Uh, he was a best-selling author. He had won a Pulitzer Prize writing about Lawrence of Arabia. He wrote a biography. Um, he'd been on the Oprah show. He'd been everywhere, but somehow I'd missed that. So uh, I thought I'd, I'd uh, maybe suggest a story on him, call him up, and uh, picked up the paper a few days later, and lo and behold, he was dead. Um, he'd been run down in London by a drunk driver. He was almost 75 years old. Uh, immediately conspiracy theories flourished that he was assassinated and uh, not true. I checked it out later um, with the police reports. Anyway, um, and that's what started me off, Leslie. I, uh, I, I didn't go, you know, uh, books choose authors, I found. Authors don't usually choose books. So this topic found me somehow. Maybe there's something supernatural about that. But um, I was hooked just like John Mack was hooked. And I'll, you know, we can talk about how he got involved. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about how he got involved, but also, you know, you uh, being someone who hadn't been exposed to any of this, and then to go on this journey of learning about his life, and then having for you yourself too to have to grapple with abductions and what they mean. I know you talked to abductees, you did a lot of research on it, you did a piece for Vanity Fair. So um, I guess, you know, we want to hear about how, how John got in uh, into it, and that's a long answer, I'm sure, but it'd be also interesting to hear about how it affected you and your perceptions. Yeah, well, um, you know, I was skeptical uh, in the beginning. I mean, who, who is not skeptical? You know, when somebody writes about people getting abducted, you know, kidnapped by little guys, aliens, and put on, uh, you know, spaceships for experiments and reproductive procedures to, to produce a hybrid race, I mean, who, ta who takes that on face value? Um, and John Mack didn't, and I certainly didn't. Um, but I must say that um, many of the people who are so-called, you know, skeptics or debunkers have not done the kind of research that John Mack did and that I had to do for this book. You really have to delve into the material uh, to understand why the subject is so mysterious and compelling. Uh, it's easy to, you know, say, well, these people are crazy or, you know, this is nonsense, it's a delusion, or I have the answer, it's sleep apnea, they have nightmares, and then they think, you know, um, none of these explanations fit, actually. Um, so, uh, yes, I was skeptical, and I try to maintain my skepticism throughout the writing, and that's why the, one of the subtitles of the book is Hard Science, um, because I do subject these uh, claims to um, scientific examination, um, and um, the problem is uh, that there is none. <laughs> uh, we'll find out at the end that uh, it's, a, it's a mysterious phenomenon. There is no easy explanation. Uh, I grappled with it, um, but I was as hooked as John Mack was and it, it changed me. I mean, it opened me to a range of 
um, anomalous experience, including the writings of, of Charles Ford, a great anomalist who said uh, the field is like uh, looking for a needle that was never lost in a haystack that never was. That's <laughs> uh, it's sort of the level of frustration. But anyway, a uh, long answer to, to your question. Yeah, that's a great quote. So, I mean, yeah, it would be interesting maybe to go a little more into, you know, so John Mack was just this psychiatrist at a very high level position at Harvard University, very well respected. And how did he get into this? You know, I mean, that's, you know, and what convinced him uh, that it was not just fantasy, that it really was something to be taken seriously. Well, I mean, he went out publicly with this. That's how much he believed in it. Or maybe yeah. belief isn't the right word, even though it's the title of your book. He might object to that, you know, but, um, you know, he was convinced that, that there was something to this. So uh, talk about how that happened for him. What convinced it, him? It was a long, a long a roundabout a route that he took. Uh, he did not start off as a, as a, um, a, a you know, likely prospect for paranormal uh, experience. Um, he grew up in a qu quite conventional German Jewish secular household with parents who were uh, professors. Uh, he made a point of saying that they were very um, unsuperstitious. Uh, they read the Bible of, of, as literature at home. He was never taught to believe in the Bible as the word of God. Um, and he started off very conventionally um, as a you know, medical professional trainee. Um, and he um, started having some uh, unusual experiences uh, professionally. Uh, I mean, first of all, he was a great social reformer. So he was very well grounded in, in this reality. He reformed um, hospital care in Cambridge, which was then a very downtrodden part of uh, the Boston area. Um, he uh, got involved in, um, he went to see Lawrence of Arabia, like we all did, you know, the movie. And uh, unlike us, uh, he didn't just walk away. He decided to investigate Lawrence and he spent 12 years, you know, uh, researching and writing a biography of, of Lawrence that won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, he got involved in Middle East peacekeeping and, uh, you know, uh, trying to make peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. He met with Yasser Arafat. He got involved in anti-war activities and anti-nuclear weapons. And he got arrested in Nevada at a nuclear test. So he did all these rather uh, counterculture, but very well grounded social things. And then something happened. He went out to Esalen, you know, the great psychic think tank, think tank on the West Coast, and uh, learned about holotropic breathing, which was a breathing discipline uh, where you can change your levels of consciousness without drugs, drugs without drugs. Um, and he found himself to turn back to a previous life or earlier stages of his childhood. And this was amazing to him that his consciousness could be changed. And then uh, he ran into somebody, a fellow psychiatrist who told him about your friend, Bud Hopkins, who was an artist who had already embarked on this um, search for um, you know, extraterrestrial creatures, let's say, or ab ab abduction experiencers. And John learned about it from Bud Hopkins. So that changed his life. And, uh, you know, that, uh, from then on, he was hooked. And how he was hooked and what he did, you know, we'll, we'll talk about. But that's basically the process. Yeah. So he went over to, I think he went over to visit. I mean, Bud used to tell me the story too, how he went over to visit Bud. And Bud showed him a whole bunch of letters that he'd received because Bud had published a story about a case in New Jersey, he'd published it in New York City. And he got all these letters from people. I guess it was, no, I guess he'd written his book, Missing Time, by then. Right. right? Well, Bud, yeah, Bud yeah. was a great- Give the chronology there. Yeah, he was a great pioneer. And again, a very unlikely person to do this. He was an artist and right. a very fine artist. He'd been written up in the New York Times. He was both a painter and a sculptor. And his uh, um, townhouse in, on the west side, as you know, uh, contained these wonderful flat sculptures, brightly colored sculptures called the, he called them his guardians, his guardians. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, Bud, uh, in the 60s, when he, as he was an artist, he was uh, living in Cape Cod and he was on his way to a party and he, he and the people in the car saw a UFO in the sky. And they got to the party and 
excitedly told everybody, hey, we saw a UFO. <laughs> and they all chimed in, oh, we saw a UFO too. Oh, we've seen UFOs. So he realized there's gotta be something to this. So he started doing research um, and um, he, he taught himself hypnosis. So he could talk, he could hypnotize the people who uh, supposedly had these experiences and try to delve beyond their, their conscious uh, memories. Um, and hypnosis is a, um, let's say a controversial area we can talk about. Um, but anyway, he did illuminate this area. He wrote a book called Missing Time about how uh, people who have, who remember be seeing, uh, you know, uh, strange craft or UFOs uh, then arrive at their destinations, you know, two hours later, and they don't know what happened in the meantime. And, and Bud was able to find out, uh, you know, regress them and probe their memories. And it turned out they had all these encounters with or remembered um, or thought they remembered, you take your pick, um, encounters with alien beings. So this was the um, information he was prepared to share with, uh, with John Mack. But it's, it's something interesting happened just before that. Um, John was visiting his friend, Robert Lifton a famous psychiatrist who'd written about Nazi war criminals uh, and uh, uh, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I actually got to meet him through Buddy. He was a good Lifton guy. is a great guy, still yeah. alive, uh, you know, up in years, but a wonderful intellectual and yeah. pillar of the psychiatric establishment. So John was visiting him and he said, you know, I've had this uh, offer to meet Bud Hopkins. I think it's nonsense, but uh, I, I could meet Bud Hopkins. And by the way, he said, John said, I know you know Bud from Cape Cod because all the psychiatrists go there in the summer. Uh, so that's why you can't get an analyzed in the summer because uh, your, your analyst is in Cape Cod. Uh, so he said, you know, Bud, uh, why don't you come with me? And Lifton's wife then spoke up, uh, very strange and said, uh, no. She said, uh, Bob has a choice about getting involved in this and you don't. You know, that's like Cassandra. A prophecy or something. Prophecy. And, and she was right somehow. Yeah. So John went alone uh, to Bud's house. And that's when he saw all these letters that people had written Bud after his book, Missing Time, with all their experiences. I got abducted. I, this happened to me. And um, Bud said to John, look, don't take my word for it. Uh, take these letters and, and read them and decide for yourself. So, you know, again, at that point, John was very skeptical and he thought it was these people were probably crazy. And um, he took the letters, but once he looked at them and it took a while, um, he started collecting his own group of, of, you call them abductees, you can call them experiencers, a more neutral term, but people who, who claim to have these extraordinary experience, stupefying experiences, I call them in my book. Um, so, um, but so Ralph, were they already, did he already have clients who were having these experiences before he went to Bud or did they well, start going to him as a result of his interest in this? Right. How did, did that, how did that connection happen? Oh, um, he got the letters from Bud and he said, I can't believe that all these people are writing Bud with these experiences. It was new to him. He did not right. have people coming to him uh, beforehand. He, it was, it was a, a, an earthquake. Uh, that there could be people walking around remembering or, or, or uh, you know, uh, saying they remembered. You know, you gotta be careful about the terminology here, what's real and what's not real. But they certainly had traumatic uh, memories um, of, of these encounters. So that all came to him afterwards. How did it, but how did they how did they end up going to John? I mean, they must have somehow they must have known he was interested in it, or yeah, well, you know they, what I mean. How did it start showing up in his own with his own patients? Well, when he got the letters from Bud, he he went about collecting a group of experiences himself. I see. And um, he got to some of them right back, back in at Harvard. I mean, he put out the word that he was interested in people with anomalous experiences, and it, they were not hard to find. He quickly. Right very quickly yeah. collected a group of over a dozen. And what was interesting is that the group was a cross section. Um, they weren't, um, you know, one gender, they weren't one age, they weren't, you know, professional in one way or the other. Uh, it was a complete cross section, which was one of the things that struck him afterwards. 
There were also children, this is astounding, um, as young as two years old, um, who would tell their parents, uh, um, little man, take me up in the sky, I fly in the sky. And, um, and John Mack uh, realized later that these kids when, could not possibly have been influenced by the books they'd read or, or the movies they'd seen, you know, Close Encounters, the third kind. They were, you know, um, innocent. Uh, yeah. Yet they had these, these memories. Anyway, so he collected this group around him and that's how he started. Yeah, and he, I know he eventually had support groups. So, yeah, and I remember John, he, I mean, it's also, I think, important that not all these stories were told through hypnosis. I think a lot of John's clients, whom he worked with for long periods of time, you know, he really got to know them, he really dug into it, whereas Bud tended to do a few hypnotic regressions, maybe one or two with somebody. But it's different when you're a psychiatrist and you're really working with people. Oh, wow. So, you know, he was obviously qualified to determine whether these were fantasies or whether the people were hallucinating or whether they had mental issues, you know, more than Bud was. Right, absolutely. So right. I'd love to know about, so, you know, what process did he go through in terms of his professional knowledge that, that took him to the place where he actually believed that these people were, I don't know, telling the truth or at least that something had really happened to them. You know, he was qualified to make that determination. He was, and um, he, um, I mean, he said this many times, he said it to his own, you know, therapist, and I have the tapes of some of his, uh, you know, therapy sessions. He said, look, uh, this is my field. I'm supposed to know this stuff. Um, and uh, it, uh, first of all, it was not all hypnosis. And a lot of the critics said, well, sure, under hypnosis, you can get people to believe anything. You can implant the suggestions. And there was a big controversy years ago about, you know, uh, f uh, false memories. But uh, he said, so first of all, some of these memories are uh, really at the upper le at the level of, of consciousness that people can actually recall these things happening. They're not only at night, so it's not sleep apnea. Uh, it happens sometimes in the middle of the day, driving a car. In one case, a woman was riding a snowmobile and this happened. But this was his field. And he was pretty adamant about that, that people would uh, challenge him and second guess him and he had written a book on nightmares, by the way, uh, early in his career. He'd studied nightmares. So he knew what a nightmare was. So people who would say to him later, oh, you don't understand. These people are just having nightmares. You know, He would say, look, I know nightmares. And um, he also knew hypnosis, although he had to teach himself hypnosis again after medical school uh, in order to go into this field. So he was way more qualified than, than Bud um, and it, uh, it really uh, resulted in a parting of the ways at one point, as, as I'm sure you remember from your contacts with Bud, um, they, they came out with rather different takes on this whole phenomenon. But um, again, um, for, for Bud Hopkins, an artist, I mean, you could say, well, it's great that an artist comes to the field fresh. He's not, um, and, you know, um, uh, He's not uh, laden with you know preconceptions or psychological mumbo jumbo or whatever. But on the other hand, he's not a professional. He's an artist. He doesn't you know he taught himself hypnosis. He may, maybe he made some mistakes, as some people later claimed um, that he was less than rigorous in his methodology. John was rigorous in his methodology, and he knew he always had somebody present with him during the hypnosis session so that people couldn't women couldn't claim later that they were abused or that something untoward happened. Uh, he was meticulous in not planting suggestions beforehand on what they should remember. Uh, he, I mean, he, he was a professional. So yeah. you're exactly right, Leslie, that he, um, he was uniquely qualified to pursue a, 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 an area that is really heavily uh, involved with the functions of, of the human psyche. Yeah, and I think just, to, just so that people are clear though, I know that Bud, he, did, he didn't teach himself hypnosis, as I recall, he trained with a, a psychologist who taught him hypnosis. And then he worked with this, he, when he started for the first maybe three years or something, he had this professional with him for every session. So I think he got pretty good at the technique of hypnosis. He did get you know, good. But that's, yeah. that's, what you're, obviously what we're talking about is something way more than that. And he was really more of a support person for people, you know, he just, he was just somebody who could be there 
and hear them and make them feel heard. And then he would have these support groups for people. And he was just sort of a listening ear, but he was not a psychotherapist. He couldn't help them right. with problems that they were having as a result of it. That's the point. Um, and I think that's, yeah. So there's just another level. So when John came onto the scene, it just brought so much credibility and just took the whole issue of abductions to another well, that's, level. That's the thing that, that yeah. transformed this field that, um, you know, when, you know, Bud Hopkins was doing it and they were joined by a third um, practitioner, uh, David Jacobs of Temple University, who also practiced some uh, hypnosis and convened his own group of experiencers and his expertise had begun as a historian uh, studying the UFO phenomenon. He wrote a, a book that became a classic, The UFO Controversy in the US. In the US. And um, uh, he became suddenly an expert in the 70s in the whole UFO controversy. And he joined their group um, in a sense, sort of probing these experiences. But um, as you say, neither, neither, neither David Jacobs nor Bud were uh, professionals and they didn't claim to be otherwise. I mean, they right. were pioneers right. and they deserve credit for bringing this to light. But when John Mack entered the, um, the field, it was uh, astounding because he brought with it all the credibility of, uh, of his background at Harvard and his peel of surprise for Lawrence of Arabia. And um, he was a magnetic personality. He was charismatic, he was good looking, he had you know, cobalt eyes that were particularly attractive to the ladies. Uh, the <laughs> I can vouch for that. I can vouch for that because oh, I knew him. Um, yeah, no, he just, he was, and then, you know, so he was also all over the media because of who he was when his book Abduction came out. So. Right. What can you, you know, there's so many great media interviews with him, but what did you think that the media overall treated him fairly or do you think they overall kind of ridiculed him? Well, it's interesting. He had a lot of media. You're absolutely right. Uh, he was a, a magnet for the media because for the same reasons I was attracted to the story, you know, Harvard psychiatrist who's writing about alien abduction. Uh, you, you know, you don't need to be a journalist to understand why that is uh, you know, uh, um, you know, terrific story. Um, but um, he, um, was he treated fairly? That's an interesting question. He got a lot of attention, that's for sure. Um, he was on Oprah. And as a matter of fact, uh, now with the attention that Oprah has gotten with her, you know, uh, Royals uh, interview, uh, it's interesting to go back to 1994 and see the interview she did with John Mack and uh, a, a, an experiencer. Randy Nickerson, right? That one. And on that show, it was... Um, uh, the, the I just whole... looked at that again, by the way. It was fascinating. She, yeah. Randy was on the show, actually, yeah. with mother and sister. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. and, and Oprah is interesting because she was a bit... She was skeptical, of course, and people in the audience were skeptical. Uh, and John, um, I mean, he... Uh, he he didn't, he didn't have a good uh, um, filter, is the right word. Um, he said what was on his mind. He didn't right. say, gee, this is gonna come out a little strange. This is gonna get me in trouble. He just said what he wanted to say. So when he was being interviewed by uh, the New York Times Magazine or Psychology Today uh, and famously Time Magazine, which um, uh, really pulled a fast one on him, it turns out, um, he would say to the reporter, uh, is it okay if I talk about astrology or uh, how about, uh, can we talk about drugs? And his, <laughs> his handlers would, you know, would sit in on the end and say, no, you know, don't talk about drugs because he took LSD. Um, he was experimenting with that as well. Anyway, he was very naive. He would ask the reporter, could he talk about this? Could he talk about that? Um, so he, he did um, he was incautious. As a matter of fact, that was, I found in, in writing The Believer, that was kind of a key to his character. He was, an, he was passionate, he was an enthusiast, mm -hmm. uh, he was careless. Um, uh, uh, he didn't care much about, you know, monitoring himself uh, right. in many ways, in many ways, in his personal life as well. But in the end, I, I think he was very heroic that he, he tackled this subject. But anyway, we got a little ahead of ourselves. Um, 
but um, yeah, so I guess the media really just depended on who it was that was interviewing him. Obviously, there would be a range of, of reactions to him, but he certainly did get a lot of attention. That's for sure. Well, he did, and um, of course, this came back to bite him when uh, Harvard started getting you know a lot of questions from trustees. Or so you know, who is this guy who's uh, always he's always identified as coming from Harvard, of course. Right. So Harvard was you know became an immediate part of the of the discussion of the psychiatrist from Harvard just saying this, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, and in your book, you talk about what happened to him. They tried to oust him at Harvard, basically. Well, so you want to just, in a nutshell, describe, you know, just briefly uh, what he went through with Harvard? I mean, I call it, and, and it's their word they used at one point, Harvard uh, committee called it, it, they said it was not an inquisition, which immediately suggested <laughs> that <laughs> what it was not right. maybe it was. But it was certainly a secret inquest a committee to look into his um, scientific methods, his medical practice procedures. Was he uh, too sympathetic to these people? Was he not distancing him in, in himself enough from these people? Were they his patients or were they his research subjects? They never answered that question and it remained kind of uh, obscure, uh, ambiguous. Um, but um, for, for a lot of reasons, including the fact that John Mack wrote a best-selling book, Abduction, with 13 case studies, and you know his uh, colleagues could never forgive the fact that he wrote a best-selling book. I mean, in academia, that's a no-no to, to write a best-selling book, a popular book. Um, uh, and he had tried to, to write peer review articles and he had, he had a lot of trouble getting them accepted, in particular one case. Um, and he decided he was gonna go the popular route um, so he had done the best-selling book, Abduction. Uh, he had been on Oprah. He'd done these interviews. So all that brought them to the attention of Harvard. And they convened this high-level committee with a high-level Harvard Medical School uh, uh, you know, professor who's the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Arnold Relman. And they subjected John to a terrible ordeal of questioning and you know, uh, going through his material and interviewing experiencers on their own. They had experiences testifying to them. And they read John's books and, and in the end, they had decided, well, there's nothing really wrong that he did. He was a little too enthusiastic, which he admitted, um, but he, he got off uh, without any discipline and it cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. And he had an unbelievable defense team, which we can talk about separately, uh, because that's, that's a good part of the book. You know, Harvard never issued a public report on the investigation. Uh, they just said it was a secret investigation. So they didn't even acknowledge it at the time. After it was over, they just put out a press release saying, um, John Mack is a member of good standing of the Harvard Medical School, and uh, he's going to be really careful <laughs> what he does from now on. But th that's a far. How did you get access? So you, Ralph, got access to all these quote secret documents about that trial, right? That they've never been they've never been brought forward before, or if you want to call it a trial, inquisition, whatever. But you got access to that material, right? right? For the first time. I got access to his paper. It was all in his records, his papers. See. Oh. Uh, uh, when uh, after he was run over, uh, and I decided I wanted to pursue the story, I couldn't interview him, but I could, you know, collect information. Um, I, I talked to his family, and and in, in the end, they gave me access to all his papers, his archives, his personal journals. He taped everything, his his tape therapy sessions with his guru, um, and uh, so that furnished me a tremendous, uh, you know, window into his mind uh, as a biographer. You know, it's what everybody, every writer hopes for, dreams of, because if you don't have access to the subject, that's the next best thing, or maybe even better, because he wouldn't have remembered or he told me all the things that I found in his in his papers. Mm -hmm. um, um, but what I was able to do was piece together uh, what happened at Harvard and this so-called Inquisition from um, um, legal memoranda that his lawyers provided that were in his emails back and forth, that was in an unpublished manuscript that he tried to uh, write and sell that he never was able to. Um, so um, yes, I, uh, I, I pieced it together. Yeah, you did. And I think that's a really fascinating part of the book and that's, it's all new stuff, you know, it's never really come out before. So 
yeah, I mean, I, I can't pretend I haven't read the book, even though I'm asking you these questions. So yeah, it's just really, really groundbreaking that you got all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you got a lot of getting that access to that. I mean, you learned a lot about his personal life too, his relationship, you know, the fact that he was married and he had all these other relationships with women. I mean, I don't know, you know, how that shaped your perceptions of who he was or if that's important, but you did include it in the book. I well, don't know if you I want did. to comment on that at all. I did. And, you know, I, I had extensive interviews with his, his wife, Sally, uh, who died shortly after um, I, I, was, I was in the middle of the book, but I did get to talk to her and I got her kind of candid uh, take on, on their relationship. I spoke to his three sons uh, who were very forthcoming and, you know, other family members, relatives and friends. So, um, and, you know, as I say in the book, John, John was an open book. Uh, he was not a secretive sneaking around kind of guy. Sally knew pretty quickly um, that, that when he was having an affair. And he didn't really keep it from her. He said he, he was, um, was part of his makeup. Uh, and that turned out to be an interesting key to his, uh, his psyche because, um, and this is a part of the book that I, I develop at, at some length. Um, he had a traumatic, a very traumatic childhood. His mother died at eight and a half months of, um, of uh, appendicitis actually. Um, and penicillin had just been invented, but it was not in regular use. It would have saved her probably. Uh, but suddenly she was gone. Uh, he didn't know what had happened to his mother. He was searching for his, her, his whole life. Uh, his father remarried pretty quickly and that's sort of an interesting story we can get to. So he had a stepmother with all you know, the baggage that that implies. But he, was, he, he himself realized he was always in some kind of search for the ineff ineffable. Uh, whether it was a missing mother or something in the cosmos or consciousness. And, and this um, was a factor in his search for, for you know, for alien, alien abduction, aliens, con cosmic consciousness, and later on, all the other things he came to investigate, including life after death. Um, but his personal biography looms very large. And, and this, this search for the missing mother, without coming off as an armchair you know, psychiatrist, which I try to resist. Um, but other people told me that, that the search for the mother was expressed in his, um, his romantic escapades. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily for him, they were always with phenomenal women uh, who supported him, uh, who were you know, very loving and, and you know, just extraordinary women and uh, who, who talked to me, by the way, for the book. So I was very happy. Some were reluctant in the beginning, but, um, uh, and John talked about these women in his therapy sessions. So he would ask his, uh, his therapist, you know, what should I do here? What should I do there? I just met this new woman. So I got a pretty good idea of, of what was going on. Amazing, you got to listen to those. Didn't you feel kind of almost questioning whether you should be listening to these tapes of his sessions with his therapist? I mean, that's well, pretty intense. I didn't know <laughs> all of it, Leslie, I gotta tell you. The truth. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you asked, did it change my opinion of him? Uh, you know, he's a human being. And um, as I say at the end of the book, in, in some ways, John Mack was every man. Um, he had the foibles of every human being. Uh, he was not, you know, uh, uh, reliable in his relationships uh, to some extent. Uh, he was, you know, uh, I mean, he was, he was normal. <laughs> he was a person. Um, but beyond that, he had a vision uh, for, for what he was after. And I think he was very brave. And I say this at the end of the book uh, to pursue this in the face of all the ridicule that he was facing in the Harvard, you know, uh, inquisition or committee, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, but he was, a, he was a human being like, like the rest of us. So what is it about him, would you say, that sort of, to you, really stands out? I mean, he went through this whole journey, the essence of who he was and sort of what to you makes him an outstanding person, which obviously he was. Uh, yes. Is, um, it, is it possible to articulate that? Yeah, I, very, very much so. I mean, I, as I you know, mentioned before, his enthusiasm enthusiasms really come through. And again, I, 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 I allude to it in the subtitle of the book, The Passion of John Mack. I mean, it's not necessarily a reference to, to a crucifixion, 
<laughs> Although <laughs> some supporters might say, you know, he was crucified, but um, he was a man of passion. As a matter of fact, there's a quote in the book by a, a religion, religion, professor of religion, uh, who um, wrote him at one point. Um, and I love this quote. He said, "You are like a man born deaf who discovers Mozart, who, who, who discovers hearing and Mozart in the same day." or a man born blind um, who discovers, uh, who, re who gains sight and discovers Van Gogh in the same day. Hmm. Um, and that I thought kind of put the finger on it. He had these huge enthusiasms. I mean, at one point I tell a story, he's with his son at a Red Sox game. He was a big Red Sox fan and they go get a, a hot dog at the game. And, um, and John Mack is, you know, waxing euphoric over the hot. This is the greatest. Oh, listen, this hot dog! <laughs> it was a hot dog. You know? This is the greatest hot dog, you know. And his son looked at him and said, "Wow, you know." So people around him noticed that. Yeah, I mean, I re I knew him for a number of years, and I I definitely remember that about him. He was just intensely alive, just intensely tuned in and experiencing everything. You know, really, really. I don't know how, but he, and he, what, he had a sort of naivete about him, almost a childlike quality, yeah. where at the same time, he was absolutely brilliant, you know, there yeah. was a, a, a very unusual combination. Exactly, put your finger on it. It was this yeah. strange combination of naivete, and Bud, your, your friend Bud, our friend Bud, uh, noticed this about him and really uh, tried to edit him, uh, you know, when he was writing his book and said, you're going to come, come across as gullible, John. Don't say right. this. Don't say that. Uh, but he plunged ahead. And, you know, he could get away with it more easily than someone like Bud because he was a psychiatrist. So, you know, he could, he, he could take chances in a way that Bud couldn't. So Bud was probably way more guarded, you know. Right. About what he would say and wouldn't say, but um, yeah, for a minute, yeah. this this leads to it really about how he and Bud sort of went on into separate directions at some point. Um, Bud and David Hopkins were very much wedded to the reality. You mean the, David Jacobs? David Jacobs. Uh, yeah. Bud and David Jacobs were very right. much uh, wedded to the idea, the reality of these experiences. They they came uh, through so powerfully to them from the people they, they were interviewing and hypnotizing uh, that they thought this had to be happening in some very, uh, uh, very noticeable reality. And mm -hmm. this was really happening and on and on. And John came to doubt that and thought that um, they were happening all right. These people were not lying, but it was happening in some way we don't recognize in conventional reality. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and that led to a kind of a parting of the ways. They reconciled later at the end of their lives. But uh, it, it's an interesting debate about, you know, uh, where this stuff is happening, because it's not happening on the street in front of us. We know that. We don't see it happening. And yet these people are so traumatized by what they, they remember, or they, they say they've encountered, that it's impossible not to believe them. And if you listen to the tapes, which John played to, to Harvard audiences of these women recounting the right. fact that they, they, their pregnancies were removed, their eggs were removed, and they were they lost their child to you know alien um, you know reproductive doctors. I mean, it's crazy stuff, and yet um, it, it's it seemed to be happening somehow, somewhere. So right, that exactly, that, yeah. I remember hearing a lot of uh, buds. In fact, I used to sit in on some of Bud's Bud Hopkins' sessions with abductees. And so I, I went through the whole process and I did get to know a lot of them and I listened to a lot. I mean, there is definitely, there's something going on there, that's for sure. And I, as you say, Bob was very rooted in the physicality of it and his whole, his journey, what he wanted to do was document physical aspects of it. So he had these collections of photographs of marks on people's bodies and you know, if the UFO landed outside the house, he wanted to show them the marks that the UFO made. And it was very much trying to physicalize it. And I think I remember when I was with the two of Bud, Bud and John Mack, the, the discussions they would have where, where John got to the point where he would say, you know, I don't really care about physical evidence. I don't think it's important. And that would drive Bud absolutely nuts. And that would drive the, the experiences crazy. What do you mean you don't care about? Well, it would depend on who they were because some of them were just so much 
working with John, I don't think it mattered necessarily to them either. And some of them felt it had a very spiritual aspect to them, whereas others felt it was absolutely terrifying and they were taken against their will. The people had different responses, but the people in Bud's camp were very much focused on the physicality and, and John's not so much. And it was just an interesting, I think they're both important. You know, I mean, yeah. you never, I think John it's thought like, you could never prove it through physical evidence, so okay. why bother? And you know, this is what drove the heart right. people crazy too. They said, what do you mean you can't prove this physically? I mean, how dare you, you know, propound this, this thesis of alien abduction without coming in with proof? So John said, well, I don't have proof. What he had, was fragmentary things that were interesting. There were scars on some of the people that, who could not explain how they got it, including a, a quadriplegic who couldn't move and could not have inflicted these scars on himself. Uh, there were uh, strange areas uh, outside houses where grass didn't grow, where a UFO yeah. had landed and seemed to be different. Um, and Bud had a lot of that kind of evidence too. I uh, think the press well, also wants yeah. us to yeah. take questions now. Well, this seems like a good time to ask the first question uh, that uh, your audience is, is asking, which is, is there any physical proof of extraterrestrial objects or unexplained remains of non-human beings? Uh, if you believe the stuff on the internet, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, in, in the world I come from, and Leslie, uh, where we have to prove things uh, to our editors at the New York Times, uh, the answer is no. Uh, we do not have uh, evidence that we regard as, as uh, sufficient or robust enough uh, to present, uh, to, to, to back up the claims that alien remains have been recovered from crashed you know, spaceships, et cetera. Uh, a lot of stories around, a lot of accounts, but uh, proof as we found in this field is notoriously uh, elusive. There's fragmentary stuff. I was about to say that uh, John, uh, John Mack had cases where um, uh, people would be observed missing from their beds. Children would go to see their parents at night. The parent, the parent would not be there and then would later recount an abduction experience. So there, there are witness cases of people being absent uh, when they reported an abduction experience. But none of that stuff is, is strong enough to really support a proof of alien abduction in any kind of physical sense that we need. There's a question for Leslie. Are you aware, Leslie, are you aware of Jens C. Spence? He was interviewed by Bud Hopkins. He was an alleged witness of the Linda Cortile abduction. Yes, I am aware. I remember him. And I remember I talked to a lot of people who were involved in that that incredible case that Bud wrote about in the book called Witnessed. So yes, I do remember Yancey. Um, <laughs> well, that, that, I just wanna say that's a mysterious reference to one of the landmark cases that we, no way we can possibly get into that here, but if it's in my book and it's in you know Bud's book, Witnessed, by a woman who was supposedly abducted out of her 11th floor window overlooking the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, an amazing case that like everything else, it didn't really lead to anything uh, conclusive. So buy the believer, purchase the believer, read the believer, and you will learn more about that case. You buy it from Shakespeare. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, there are two questions about Jacques Vallée. Uh, you know, people are curious about why, what he thought of Mac, and, um, you know, the, Billy and Jose say, uh, I just read Jack Vallée's memoirs from the 1990s and in his book, Forbidden Science 4, he seemed to make a point of repeatedly dismissing the wonderful work of John Mack. Um, Why do you think Jack Vallée would go out of his way to write negatively about John Mack that way? Well, um, I know something about uh, Jacques Vallée. Uh, we've communicated, I know his work. I great, I'm a great respecter of his folklore uh, uh, histories and, and insights. Um, the thing about Jacques Vallée, and he's the first one to say this about himself, he says, um, I'm the only UFO investigator who, who doesn't know what they are. Uh, he admits that he has been on both sides of the issue. He says they're real. He says they're not real. Um, he is an eternal questor. Um, 
Um, so I think you have to read his work very carefully and not say that he, he was against John Mack or he dismissed John Mack. He said sometimes contradictory things uh, at the same time, but he is an enormously learned and erudite and expert um, you know, witness on, on, in this whole field. And uh, he is as puzzled or more puzzled than anybody else about this field. So that may account for, for, the, for the reaction you cite. It might be one of the takeaways of your book. It's not so much what is real, but you know what is reality, but where is reality? You know, in the case of abductees, right? Um, abductee stories. And you know, I just want to take this opportunity to say quickly that uh, John, unlike Bud and uh, David Jacobs, uh, found transformative uh, and positive aspects to the abduction experiences. He said the people emerged. Um, with a greater feeling for the earth, uh, for, um, for sp spiritual dimension, for God or deity or whatever you want to call it. So he thought that there was something good and positive out of these experiences. And, uh, and Leslie, you, call, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Bud and David um, took a much darker view of this whole phenomenon, thought aliens were basically evil and the people were traumatized and there was really nothing good to be said for, for these experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think David Jacobs was the far, on the far side of that. And then Bob was a little more to the center and then John was on the other side. And it just so, I think over time, what happened was that the abductees who felt terrified would go to Bud and the ones who felt maybe there was something else for them in there would go to John. And then there was sort of became this division of how they, view things, but, and then people would choose them for that reason, so, but I don't think Bud was quite as, as focused on the sort of, you know, the negativity as Dave Jacob was, although he certainly had many, many people come to him who were traumatized, and it was basically felt like, yeah, that he didn't think it was a good thing for people, that's right. for sure, taken against their will, um, so yeah, there were sort of two different camps there, in a way. I think this is a question that many, many people are probably asking you uh, every time you talk about uh, UFOs and abductions. Do you think that abductions is a key aspect as to why the US government military intelligence has been so secretive about the phenomena as a whole? No. Is there evidence that they no. monitor abductions and know what the purpose of them may be? No, I don't think they're concerned about abductions. I think they're concerned uh, about um, the, the technology of UFOs, um, that, that, that there is a strong military aspect uh, to, to this technology that we and the Russians and the Chinese are trying to get access to. Um, each side is fearing that's, that another country is going to get this technology first, able to develop, you know, hypersonic uh, vehicles that can operate in the water and the air that can turn invisible whatever this technology is, and nobody knows what it is, uh, they all want it. Um, but um, it, it, I, I don't think that their main concern is that, um, I mean, that uh, they're afraid people will find out about abductions. Uh, first of all, uh, the, these stories have been around a long time. John Max said he was never contacted by anybody in the government to shut up or to silence him or to interfere with his research. So, um, um, uh, I, I, I just don't think so. Maybe we'll find out in years to come that, you know, there's a secret place where aliens have been taken. There's a lot of stories around and you have to be very careful. I mean, you can read them and, you know, but what's true is, is, is hard to establish. Daniel Otis from Toronto is, uh, first of all, thank you for thank, thanking you for the great talk. Um, and to both of you, he's asking, when you investigated ATIP for the New York Times, did you learn if they researched or interviewed alleged experiences or abductees? Well, share. I mean, right? Uh, we... I mean, we, we did not learn about that, but I, I think people may know, some people may know that the his, the, uh, some of the people from Lou Elizondo, for instance, who was former head of ATIP, was involved with the History Channel show, and they did one episode in that show in which he did, he himself dealt with this question of experiencers. 
Now that doesn't mean that when he was part of ATIP that they dealt with it. Um, so we have, I mean, I haven't been told, and I don't think you have either, Ralph, about such cases that were actually part of the ATIP program. They were dealing with Navy pilots and military cases. Um, but again, if people are curious about Lou Elizondo's relationship to that topic, they could look at that History Channel series. And look, I think it was one of the very last episodes of the second season in which he did talk about it. That's, that's all I really know about it in terms of ATIP. Right, and I think it's very important to stress that in the reporting we've done for the Times, we have focused on UFOs and uh, Navy videos of these interactions that have been captured on, you know, uh, uh, thermal imaging devices and they've been eyeballed in some cases by Navy pilots. But nobody is officially or unofficially speculating to us about who's behind the wheel as they say, uh, the, where do these things come from? You know, what intelligence is behind them? Nobody knows, and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves by speculating. And certainly no one in the government that we've talked to is telling us about you know, aliens. We, we're just not at that point. Um, you speak of Mac's naivety and Bud's attempt to help Mac constrain that impulse. What are the pros and cons of their different approaches incorporating or rejecting high strangeness? Um, well, I mean, um, I think they were the same, they had the same approach in, in trying to um, prove or verify the, these stories. Um, uh, for example, I, I talk in the book about uh, the, the times uh, John uh, Mack tried to gain access to alien technology like wands, for example, or implants. Supposedly people who were abducted had things implanted in their body so that the aliens could track them later. And uh, always um, these things uh, see, uh, led to a dead end. Um, the objects that look like implants turned out to be natural products of the human body or they were lost, uh, or they disappeared. Um, and I, you know, I don't know how wedded Bud was to, to the idea that they had evidence. Maybe Leslie knows more about that. But um, John, in the end, as Leslie said, came to the conclusion that we're not gonna prove this, ever prove this. So don't even ask me about proof. Uh, the fact that these people you know, believe it's true uh, and that they've had uh, um, react, they've had psychological development as a result of this, that they've widened their horizons, co raised consciousness, that's important, but don't ask me to prove it. Yeah, so the question was the question about how high strangeness, like, I, um, the question was about um, how they both related to the, the, con the high strangeness component of it. Right. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, probably I would say, I don't know, specifically with regards to that, that probably John was a little more sort of expansive and maybe more a little open to sort of the cosmic, more paranormal aspects of, of exploring those aspects anyway. And whereas Bud was very sort of down to earth and just wanted physical, physical evidence, you know? I mean, it's the same thing we were talking about earlier, but nobody denied the high strangeness of the whole thing. Yeah. And you know, to, to mention what you're just saying, Ralph, I, mean, I remember certainly the Linda Cortelia case from um, Witness, there was an implant in her nose that you could actually see in an x-ray. I mean, there were all these tantalizing things like that. But as you say, it was very hard to get one. And, and if you got one and you could analyze it, there would never be definitive proof. It might be really weird. You know, or somebody gets a hair, like the guy in Australia, he got the hair analyzed from the supposedly this woman alien, but it was very, very strange. But still, it was never definitive that this is an alien hair or that this That's was right. an alien implant. You, you could know, never nail it down like that. Right. You could never disprove it. And, you know, one of the things John, John Mack wrestled with was, well, are the aliens so smart that they can create objects that elude, you know, testing and that seem to be products of the human body? So uh, you can't win that argument. I mean, um, you can't disprove uh, these things, but uh, they were very hard to prove. And, um, you know, yeah. I want to say one other thing quickly that uh, John progressed from um, uh, alien abduction to other aspects of, of the, uh, you know, paranormal anomalies. He got interested in crop circles. 
and uh, the, the whole search for the Holy Grail and, uh, and you know Viking runes that stones that supposedly foretell the future and um, uh, big, you know Bigfoot and uh, cattle mutilations and all these things started to interest him. Um, and in the end, life after death, and uh, some people thought it was quite fitting that uh, he died just as he was investigating life after death. Right. And um, he'd so, actually written a rough manuscript for that top on that topic, he did. He was, which I actually was was able to see because I wrote a book on that topic, and I was fortunately able to the the uh, was given the you know some of the notes and the uh, draft that he had, and yeah. It's just such an irony if only he had been able to pursue that further. I mean, how amazing that would have been. Leslie, some people say he did and does because at the, <laughs> end, of, at the end of my book, I have a chapter about, and I say, look, uh, the rest oh, he's showing book, up through mediums, right? Like the rest <laughs> of the book, I'm verifying this part. I'm not verifying. I'm just saying uh, this is what people say that he returned spiritually in some, you know, form. Uh, to appear to people uh, after he died. Yeah. Um, so maybe he, you know, as he said, I can do more work from the other side. Who knows? Let, let me ask a question that was uh, asked in the chat room and then I'll go back to the Q&A. Uh, someone is asking if you're curious and if you would consider reporting on ab abduction into the mainstream, how would you go about this if it won't provide the evidence, but it still is real? Janice said, I don't think it's going to yield its secrets to the frameworks of proof that we have developed to apply to phenomenon purely in the material world. And it's not going to give us the smoking gun. It's inviting us to stretch to it. It seems like it's almost a more important story if it is real, but not just physical. Can you answer that? Well, you know what? I mean, the, a lot has been written about this. I don't know what I could add to it. Uh, it it's kind of a I don't want to say a dead end, but if you report the experiences of experiencers, abductees, and you you know recount all, all the things they've said, and you you know you tell their stories as John did much more um, uh, you know professionally and authoritatively than I could, I'm not sure what I could add to that unless we find a case, and you know there's always that possibility of somebody who um, uh, emerges with some kind of proof. Uh, that you know would, would change the paradigm, just like we changed the paradigm with our you know December 2017 report on on ATIP and the Pentagon uh, you know office UFO office that changed the paradigm and made it safe for mainstream media to to talk about this. Will there be such a case that will change the paradigm with alien abduction? I'm not that hopeful. I, it's just much more difficult and. Um, while we have pictures of UFOs, we do have photographs of UFOs and videos. We don't have pictures, as far as I know, um, uh, verifiable p pictures of aliens. So yeah, can I just add to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with Ralph in terms of like the kind of reporting we do for the New York Times. It's just impossible. But I really respect the questioner because I think there's a way that these experiences need to be better integrated into the whole concept of what UFOs represent, of what they mean, of their paranormal aspects. And there are people in the academic world who are, who are exploring just these very things. I would recommend that people curious about that read the work of Jeffrey Kripal at Rice University, who is a professor of religion. And he's been studying these anomalous experiences for a long time. And you know the academic community is sort of growing in its interest in what they mean. But for us reporters who want to write for the New York Times, it's a whole different kind of ball game. But that doesn't—it's not to diminish the importance of the experiencers. And I think they need to. We're trying to find ways to take that all more seriously and kind of integrate it into one bigger picture of what this thing actually is, what these UFOs are. That encompasses more than just the kinds of things we can report on in the New York Times. Well, that that is a great why point. Do you, uh, why I, do you suppose people are emotionally reluctant to accept the idea of abductions and UFOs? So, uh, the question is why? Why are they emotionally? Um, why why are, do you think that there is an emotional reluctance to accept the idea? Of it's so strange. It, it's so outside the you know the people who have gone through this. It's absolutely real to them. 
the people who have not gone through this, it's impossible to fathom. So uh, that's, that's the divide. Um, that if you have not gone through an experience like that, you find it very, very hard to believe. But if you right. have gone through it and you talk to these people, they are adamant what they experience. They, they, they're not saying they dreamed this <clears throat> or they think this. They say it happened and that's in the book. But the two, the two sides are not coming together, not meeting anywhere where, where they can understand each other. You know, right. And I, I also think it's very scary for people to contemplate this. I know people that are, you know, scared of it. I mean, when I first read Whitley Strieber's Communion, I was terrified, even though I, I, then you, I realized it wasn't going to happen to me. But I think, I think it's so complex. And I think, as Ralph says, if you haven't had the experience or you don't know somebody who's had the experience, it just seems like, what? This couldn't possibly be real. Right. But I also would encourage anybody to, 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 you really have to read and do your research. And, you know, even though there's an emotional resistance to it, even I think even what's, what is in the literature and what's been published on it, and I think Ralph's book included, is enough to really open you up to the possibility or certainly the fact that something's going on here. So I think you have to be brave enough to just jump in with those emotions and, um, but yeah, it's not an easy thing to open your mind to. That's also, you know, it's very important to say that uh, John Mack realized at the end of his life that abduction was not a singular um, uh, area or experience or whatever you want to call it. It was part of a whole syndrome of anomalies. And um, uh, a lot of things don't fit. A lot of uh, the abduction stories focus on the classic or the core abduction uh, story. Somebody gets abducted, put on a spaceship, subject to reproductive experiments, but so many experiences are not like that. And uh, there are wise people in this field who said, study the things that don't fit, because they're more important than the things that fit. Why don't they fit? Well, uh, Whitley Strieber's experiences do not fit the classic abduction syndrome. And so many other things, religious experiences, Diana Pasulka and her wonderful book, American Cosmic, talks about the, the visions at Fatima um, and what the religious uh, you know, insights are to these you know, mystical visions. And what's the relationship of that to abduction? It's really part of a, a much broader question of what, what's real, what's the unseen world? How does it you know, penetrate our, uh, our reality? So it's not a simple question. It's not just one thing. I completely agree with you. Yeah, well said, Ralph. There are two, two questions, uh, and maybe we're going to uh, I, I look at the, the, the other messages, but there are two questions about the Ariel school case. When one uh, was asking if, if uh, Chan Mack had worked on the Ariel school case, and Gunther is sort of uh, answering that question. He says, I was there when I helped investigate the Ariel school case and had the pleasure of meeting Chan Mack. I want to ask if is there a consciousness element to it all? And what reality is? Is there some kind of a manipulation of reality and our perception by these encounters? Okay, first, just quickly tell people that uh, the, the case being referred to is about uh, when John Mack was going through his Harvard uh, uh, Inquisition, he heard about a case in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, a school for uh, a private day school for mixed race, for children of all races, a very progressive school, where the children one day at recess saw uh, a spaceship land, two little men got out, they interacted with the children, the children saw them, they had big eyes, they received telepathic messages from these uh, creatures. Um, and no adults were present. They were all tied up, whether that was happenstance or the aliens had figured it out. Uh, John Mack never found out, but he rushed with his, um, his partner at the time, uh, Dominique, to Zimbabwe. They interviewed these kids on camera. We have the tapes that come out. There's a, a, a documentary made about it, um, soon to be released. Um, but these children speak very persuasively about what they saw. Um, this happened in 1995, I believe, um, and they drew pictures, some of which are in my book, uh, very authentic accounts, as I said, of the young children who spoke to John Mack. He didn't think they were parroting some, you know, cultural meme or anything. They were just telling what they saw, 
and uh, people have gone back to those then children, now adults, and they remember these experiences. So it's a very, it's probably the most, or one of the most persuasive cases on record in terms of witnesses, eyewitnesses, and, and, uh, and direct accounts. But of course, it wasn't an abduction case, at least on the surface. Abduction. Again, no. this is what I said, what doesn't fit. Uh, right. the kids were not abducted. Um, so uh, it's not the core experience. Um, and the second part of that question, Francoise, I'm sorry, you said did. Uh, uh, the second part was, uh, hold on, because I've moved on. Uh, is there some kind of manipulation of reality and our perception uh, by these encounters? Well, um, you know, the fact that um, uh, no adults were present to witness this, they all heard about it afterwards. Uh, I have the story of a little girl who went running into the uh, concession shop at the school uh, shouting, uh, aliens, aliens. And the teacher on duty said, uh, hold on, um, be polite. Make sure uh, uh, you're nice to the aliens. Be polite. Make sure they have a good opinion of us. <laughs> so <laughs> she was kind of making fun of the kid. But um, there were no adults who witnessed this. Is, was that manipulation? Who knows? Plus, the, you know, there's so many cases of abductees where the people around them are kind of um, knocked out or unconscious. They're, they're somehow controlled by the aliens um, so that the person who's abducted gets abducted and the others don't wake up. I right. mean, switched off is, is the terminology that a husband and wife are in right. bed and the, the, the wife will have the abduction experience or the husband, the other one will be immobilized, uh, either see, see it and be unable to move or more commonly not see it and, and you know, sleep through it and afterwards be incredulous um, at the recounting afterwards. So um, that's part of the strangeness. Maybe to finish, there is this question, uh, I think which will be a nice way to, to end the session. Now that Gary Nolan and others are taking the overall issue of experiences seriously, how do we broaden the issue of the realm of psychiatry and psychology and encourage even more scientific research for those who claim they've had the experience? Um, well, uh, whoever raised that question is, is, is knowledgeable that uh, Gary Nolan uh, is doing uh, interesting work with um, um, trying to understand what parts of the brain, let's say, are interacting with um, outside experiences. Uh, to what extent is it a function of the mind or is it a function of consciousness? Is consciousness outside the body? This is what Leslie raises in her Netflix series. Um, um, you know, is consciousness in, in, in the brain or is it universal? Is it floating around in the cosmos and we just get pieces of it? Um, but uh, some of the research, as Gary Nolan is doing, it, you know, relies on um, analysis of, of the brain and what parts light up and, and what parts interact and what, what, what powers does the brain have, the mind or the spirit or whatever we are as human beings that we don't understand. I mean, we've and he's also up. studying the genetics too, Ralph. It's like, for you know, does it run in families? They're they're looking at genetics to see what this what the genetic imprint might be of people who are abductees. Are there any similarities yeah, there? Abducted, do they have yeah. any markings? Uh, this is a very interesting area of research. Uh, is their DNA affected? And you know, John Mack found very clearly that abduction did run in families. That. Um, it happened to a grandmother, then it happened to her child, and then it happened to a grandchild, as if, you know, the aliens were tracking generations of a family. Um, it, 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 it's impossible to know why, but it, 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 it was a pattern there like that. So why would that be? Is it transmitted in, you know, in DNA? So to answer the question, yes, there's room for really good research. Um, into these people. And, um, and we know some of the people doing this research, they're not ready to um, you know, reveal it yet because it's very fragmentary and it hasn't been peer reviewed. And, um, but uh, science, we welcome, we and anybody serious about this field uh, welcome uh, scientific um, you know, involvement in this. It's not a, a adverse to to science, it's not something you, you believe in and, and don't want science to meddle in. You want scientists to look into this and see how they can explain it. 
Right, and I think I think again to reiterate, um, it, it is something that needs to be more integrated. And I think it's not just scientists, but it's also the humanities. It's it's the academic world, people like Diana Pasolka and Jeffrey Kripal, who are already integrating this into a much bigger framework and kind of getting the academic world interested as well, not necessarily just the scientists. So. I would recommend that people look at Diana's book, American Cosmic, and also look check out the work of Jeffrey Kripal at Rice University. And we just hope that we're moving in the direction where it's going to become better known and better integrated. And I, I think all the people having these experiences, the experiences are valid and they all need to be honored and respected. And these are all part of the picture that we're trying to understand. It's not like just because Ralph and I only write about certain aspects of this in the Times doesn't mean that those are the only aspects that are important. Absolutely not. The experiencers are all, every single experience is important. Um, and it, it all, it's all part of the mystery of what we're dealing with. So I just want to make sure people understand that that's how Ralph and I see it. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and Ralph, your book reflects your, your incredible respect and insights into this and you know i just again i really recommend people read this book you're going to learn a lot about this phenomenon and what it means and not just about john but about it and even in a bigger way so yeah i just uh, i take my hat off to you Ralph, for for writing we this have, incredible book it's just we have to thank journalists like you like the, the two of you to bring all that research to uh, the general public and, and make us aware that uh, uh, th this this is a field that's moving from encounters of this third kind, which is a wonderful movie, by the way, <laughs> yeah, but from folklore to to scientific inquiry. And and uh, and so thank you very much for writing these books uh, again. Um, I the believer buy it from us. I, I've put the uh, the link to buy the book on in the chat box. And I want to uh, thank all of you. There's a, maybe a one last question, but I already want to thank both of you for this really, really wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, uh, just to finish, uh, is anyone continuing John Max's work on UFOs and abductees? Is anyone continuing? said that there are many people who are continuing his work. Oh, is anybody continuing it? Yeah, yes. yeah, I think like we've been saying, definitely there's a lot of great interest. I don't know anybody, well, there are probably people that still regress, you know, do hypnotic regressions with clients and things like that, but um, there's there's definitely a lot of interest in this and trying to understand what it really means. Ooh, it's moved into yeah. other directions of scientific research. There's no one like John Mack. I mean, I, you know, you'll say right. I'm, I'm biased because I wrote the book about him, but there is no, you know, a long time before someone comes along like him with the courage and the charisma, and he plunged into a, you know, a, a um, uh, virgin field. So now when, you know, uh, it's, it's different today. And, and a lot of people saw what happened to him in terms of the ridicule he got. So they're not willing to, you know, to, to reproduce that, but um, there is research going on. And, um, and I echo Francois's uh, appeal to read the book, buy the book from Shakespeare. And um, uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to be on with Leslie and, uh, and you, and I know Shakespeare Company is my neighborhood bookstore. It's a great place, good coffee, good pastries. <laughs> good it's true, very good coffee, <laughs> uh, great books, you know, not not just on, on you know not not only nonfiction fiction mm -hmm. anything you want it's a, a, a it is a, a pretty nice bookstore although I say so mm -hmm. myself and it's it's worth visiting if you are in in New York uh, I I just want to say quickly that there is a recording of this uh, conversation and it will be available for about two weeks if you want to have a, a copy I will send it to uh, to the both of you so you can put it on, on your social media. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Buy the book, it's really worth reading. It's really worth giving to your best friend and, and anyone who's interested in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of topic. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the great questions. Yep, a lot of great pleasure, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.